Portion one of The Grey Woman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jane Greensmith of JaneGS.com. The Grey Woman by Elizabeth Cleghorn Gaskell. Portion one. There is a mill by the Neckar side to which many people resort for coffee, according to the fashion which is almost national in Germany. There is nothing particularly attractive in the situation of this mill. It is on the Mannheim, the flat and unromantic, side of Heidelberg. The river turns the mill wheel with a plenteous gushing sound. The outbuildings and the dwelling house of the miller form a well kept dusty quadrangle. Again, further from the river, there is a garden full of willows and arbors and flower beds not well kept but very profuse in flowers and luxuriant creepers, knotting and looping the arbors together. In each of these arbors is a stationary table of white painted wood, and light movable chairs of the same color and material. I went to drink coffee there with some friends in 1840. The stately old miller came out to greet us, as some of the party were known to him of old. He was of a grand build of a man, and his loud musical voice, with its tone, friendly and familiar, his rolling laugh of welcome, went well with the keen bright eye, the fine cloth of his coat, and the general look of substance about the place. Poultry of all kinds abounded in the mill-yard, where there were ample means of livelihood for them strewed on the ground, but not content with this, the miller took out handfuls of corn from the sacks and threw liberally to the cocks and hens that ran almost under his feet in their eagerness. And all the time he was doing this, as it were habitually, he was talking to us, and ever and anon calling to his daughter and the serving-maids to bid them hasten the coffee we had ordered. He followed us to an arbor, and saw us served to his satisfaction with the best of everything we could ask for, and then left us to go round to the different arbors and see that each party was properly attended to. And as he went, this great, prosperous, happy-looking man whistled softly one of the most plaintive airs I ever heard. His family have held this mill ever since the old Palatinate days, or rather, I should say, have possessed the ground ever since then, for two successive mills of theirs have been burnt down by the French. If you want to see Scherer in a passion, just talk to him of the possibility of a French invasion. At this moment, still whistling that mournful air, we saw the miller going down the steps that led from the somewhat raised garden into the mill-yard, and so I seemed to have lost my chance of putting him in a passion. We had nearly finished our coffee, and our kuchen, and our cinnamon cake, when heavy splashes fell on our thick, leafy covering. Quicker and quicker they came, coming through the tender leaves as if they were tearing them asunder. All the people in the garden were hurrying under shelter, or seeking for their carriages standing outside. Up the steps the miller came hastening with a crimson umbrella, fit to cover every one left in the garden, and followed by his daughter and one or two maidens, each bearing an umbrella. "'Come into the house, come in, I say!' It is a summer storm, and will flood the place for an hour or two, till the river carries it away. Here, here! And we followed him back into his own house. We went into the kitchen first. Such an array of bright copper and tin vessels I never saw, and all the wooden things were as thoroughly scoured. The red tile floor was spotless when we went in, but in two minutes it was all over slop and dirt with the tread of many feet. But the kitchen was filled, and still the worthy miller kept bringing in more people under his great crimson umbrella. He even called the dogs in and made them lie down under the tables. His daughter said something to him in German, and he shook his head merrily at her. Everybody laughed. "'What did she say?' I asked. "'She told him to bring the ducks in next. But indeed, if more people come, we shall be suffocated. What with the thundery weather and the stove and all these steaming clothes, I really think we must ask leave to pass on.' Perhaps we might go in and see Frau Scherer. My friend asked the daughter of the house for permission to go into an inner chamber and see her mother. It was granted, and we went into a sort of saloon overlooking the Neckar, very small, very bright, and very close. The floor was slippery with polish, long, narrow pieces of looking-glass against the walls reflected the perpetual motion of the river opposite. A white porcelain stove with some old-fashioned ornaments of brass about it, a sofa, covered with Utrecht velvet, a table before it, and a piece of worsted worked carpet under it, a vase of artificial flowers, and, lastly, an alcove with a bed in it, on which lay the paralyzed wife of the good miller, knitting busily, formed the furniture. I spoke as if this was all that was to be seen in the room. 
but sitting quietly while my friend kept up a brisk conversation in a language which i but half understood my eye was caught by a picture in a dark corner of the room and i got up to examine it more nearly it was that of a young girl of extreme beauty evidently of middle rank there was a sensitive refinement in her face as if she almost shrank from the gaze which of necessity the painter must have fixed upon her it was not over well painted but i felt that it must have been a good likeness from this strong impress of peculiar character which i have tried to describe from the dress i should guess it to have been painted in the latter half of the last century and i afterwards heard that i was right there was a little pause in the conversation will you ask frau scherer who this is my friend repeated my question and received a long reply in german then she turned round and translated it to me it is the likeness of a great aunt of her husband's my friend was standing by me and looking at the picture with sympathetic curiosity see here is a name on the open page of this bible anna scherer seventeen seventy eight frau scherer says there is a tradition in the family that this pretty girl with her complexion of lilies and roses lost her colour so entirely through fright that she was known by the name of the grey woman she speaks as if this anna scherer lived in some state of lifelong terror but she does not know details refers me to her husband for them she thinks he has some papers which were written by the original of that picture for her daughter who died in this very house not long after our friend there was married we can ask herr scherer for the whole story if you like oh yes pray do said i and as our host came in at this moment to ask how we were faring and to tell us that he had sent to heidelberg for carriages to convey us home seeing no chance of the heavy rain abating my friend after thanking him passed on to my request ah said he his face changing the aunt anna had a sad history it was all owing to one of those hellish frenchmen and her daughter suffered for it the cousin ursula as we all called her when i was a child to be sure the good cousin ursula was his child as well the sins of the fathers are visited on their children the lady would like to know all about it would she well there are papers a kind of apology the aunt anna wrote for putting an end to her daughter's engagement or rather facts which she revealed that prevented cousin ursula from marrying the man she loved and so she would never have any other good fellow else i have heard say my father would have been thankful to have made her his wife all this time he was rummaging in the drawer of an old-fashioned bureau and now he turned round with a bundle of yellow manuscript in his hand which he gave to my friend saying take it home take it home and if you care to make out our crabbed german writing you may keep it as long as you like and read it at your leisure only i must have it back again when you have done with it that's all and so we became possessed of the manuscript of the following letter which it was our employment during many a long evening that ensuing winter to translate and in some parts to abbreviate the letter began with some reference to the pain which she had already afflicted upon her daughter by some unexplained opposition to a project of marriage but i doubt if without the clue with which the good miller had furnished us we could have made out even this much from the passionate broken sentences that made us fancy that some scene between the mother and daughter and possibly a third person had occurred just before the mother had begun to write thou dost not love thy child mother thou dost not care if her heart is broken ah god and those words of my beloved ursula ring in my ears as if the sound of them would fill them when i lay a dying and her poor tear-stained face comes between me and everything else child hearts do not break life is very tough as well as very terrible but i will not decide for thee i will tell thee all and thou shalt bear the burden of choice i may be wrong i have little wit left and never had much i think but an instinct serves me in place of judgment and that instinct tells me that thou and thy henry must never be buried yet i may be in error i would fain make my child happy lay this paper before the good priest schreisheim if after reading it thou hast doubts which make thee uncertain only i will tell thee all now on condition that no spoken word ever passes between us on the subject it would kill me to be questioned i should have to see all present again my father held as thou knowest the mill on the neckar where thy new-found uncle scherer now lives 
Thou rememberest the surprise with which we were received there last vintage twelvemonth? How thy uncle disbelieved me when I said I was his sister Anna, whom he had long believed to be dead, and how I had to lead thee underneath the picture, painted of me long ago, and point out, feature by feature, the likeness between it and thee, and how, as I spoke, I recalled first to my own mind, and then by speech to his, the details of the time when it was painted, the merry words that passed between us then, a happy boy and girl, the position of the articles of furniture in the room, our father's habits, the cherry tree, now cut down, that shaded the window of my bedroom, through which my brother was wont to squeeze himself, in order to spring on to the topmost bough that would bear his weight, and thence would pass me back his cap, laden with fruit, to where I sat on this window-sill, too sick with fright for him to care much for eating the cherries. And at length Fritz gave way, and believed me to be his sister Anna, even as though I were risen from the dead and thou rememberest how he fetched in his wife and told her that i was not dead that was come back to, to the old house once more changed as i was and she would scarce believe him and scanned me with a cold distrustful eye till at length for i knew her of old as babette muller i said i was well to do and needed not to seek out friends for what they had to give and then she asked not me but her husband why i had kept silent so long leading all father brother every one that loved me in my own dear home to esteem me dead and then thine uncle thou rememberest said he cared not to know more than i cared to tell that i was his anna found again to be a blessing to him in his old age as i had been in his boyhood i thanked him in my heart for his trust for were the need for telling all less than it seems to me now i could not speak of my past life but she, who was my sister-in-law still, held back her welcome, and, for want of that, I did not go to live in Heidelberg as I had planned beforehand, in order to be near my brother Fritz, but contented myself with his promise to be a father to my Ursula when I should die and leave this weary world. That Babata Muller was, as I may say, the cause of all my life's suffering. She was a baker's daughter in Heidelberg a great beauty as people said and indeed as i could see for myself i too thou sawest my picture was reckoned a beauty and i believe i was so babette muller looked upon me as a rival she liked to be admired and had no one much to love her i had several people to love me thy grandfather fritz the old servant katin karl the head apprentice at the mill and i feared admiration and notice and the being stared at as the schon Mullerin whenever I went to make my purchase in Heidelberg. Those were happy, peaceful days. I had Katjen to help me in the housework, and whatever we did pleased my brave old father, who was always gentle and indulgent towards us women, though he was stern enough with the apprentices in the mill. Karl, the oldest of these, was his favourite, and I can see now that my father wished him to marry me, and that Karl himself was desirous to do so. But Karl was rough-spoken and passionate, not with me, but with the others, and I shrank from him in a way which, I fear, gave him pain. And then came thy uncle Fritz's marriage, and Babetta was brought to the mill to be its mistress. Not that I cared much for giving up my post, for, in spite of my father's great kindness, I always feared that I did not manage well for so large a family, with the man and a girl under Katjen. We sat down eleven each night to supper. But when Babetta began to find fault with Katjen, I was unhappy at the blame that fell on faithful servants, and by and by I began to see that Babetta was egging on Karl to make more open love to me, and, as she once said, to get done with it and take me off to a home of my own. My father was growing old and did not perceive all my daily discomfort. The more Karl advanced, the more I disliked him. He was good in the main but I had no notion of being married, and could not bear any one who talked to me about it. Things were in this way when I had an invitation to go to Karlsruhe to visit a schoolfellow of whom I had been very fond. Babetta was all for my going. I don't think I wanted to leave home, and yet I had been very fond of Sophie Ruprecht, but I was always shy among strangers. Somehow the affair was faddled for me, but not until both Fritz and my father had made inquiries as to the character and position of the Ruprechts. 
they learned that the father had held some kind of inferior position about the grand duke's court and was now dead leaving a widow a noble lady and two daughters the elder of whom was sophie my friend madame ruprecht was not rich but more than respectable genteel when this was ascertained my father made no opposition to my going babette forwarded it by all the means in her power and even my dear fritz had his word to say in its favour only katyan was against it katyan and karl the opposition of karl did more to send me to karl's rue than anything for i could have objected to go but when he took upon himself to ask what was the good of going a gadding visiting strangers of whom no one knew anything i yielded to circumstances to the pulling of sophie and the pushing of babetta i was silently vexed i remember at babetta's inspection of my clothes at the way in which she settled that this gown was too old-fashioned or that too common to go with me on my visit to a noble lady and at the way in which she took upon herself to spend the money my father had given me to buy what was requisite for the occasion and yet i blamed myself for every one else thought her so kind for doing all this and she herself meant kindly too at last i quitted the mill by the neckar side it was a long day's journey and fritz went with me to karlsruhe the ruprechts lived on the third floor of a house a little behind one of the principal streets in a cramped up court to which we gained admittance through a doorway in the street i remember how pinched their rooms looked after the large space we had at the mill and yet they had an air of grandeur about them which was new to me and which gave me pleasure faded as some of it was madame ruprecht was too formal a lady for me i was never at my ease with her but sophie was all that i had recollected her at school kind affectionate and only rather too ready with her expressions of admiration and regard the little sister kept out of our way and that was all we needed in the first enthusiastic renewal of our early friendship the one great object of madame ruprecht's life was to retain her position in society and as her means were much diminished since her husband's death there was not much comfort though there was a great deal of show in their way of living just the opposite of what it was at my father's house i believe that my coming was not too much desired by madame ruprecht as i brought with me another mouth to be fed but sophie had spent a year or more in entreating for permission to invite me and her mother having once consented was too well-bred not to give me a stately welcome the life in karlsruhe was very different from what it was at home the hours were later the coffee was weaker in the morning the pottage was weaker the boiled beef less relieved by other diet the dresses finer the evening engagements constant i did not find these visits pleasant we might not knit which would have relieved the tedium a little but we sat in a circle talking together only interrupted occasionally by a gentleman who breaking out of the knot of men who stood near the door talking eagerly together stole across the room on tiptoe his hat under his arm and bringing his feet together in the position we called the first at the dancing school made a low bow to the lady he was going to address the first time i saw these manners i could not help smiling but madame ruprecht saw me and spoke to me next morning rather severely telling me that of course in my country breeding i could have seen nothing of court manners or french fashions but that that was no reason for my laughing at them of course i tried never to smile again in company this visit to karlsruhe took place in eighty nine just when every one was full of the events taking place at paris and yet at karlsruhe french fashions were more talked of than french politics madame ruprecht especially thought a great deal of all french people and this again was quite different to us at home fritz could hardly bear the name of a frenchman and it had nearly been an obstacle to my visit to sophie that her mother preferred being called madame to her proper title of frau one night i was sitting next to sophie and longing for the time when we might have supper and go home so as to be able to speak together a thing forbidden by madame ruprecht's rules of etiquette which strictly prohibited any but the most necessary conversation passing between members of the same family when in society i was sitting i say scarcely keeping back my inclination to yawn when two gentlemen came in one of whom was evidently a stranger to the whole party from the formal manner in which the host led him up and presented him to the hostess i thought i had never seen any one so handsome or so elegant his hair was powdered of course 
but one could see from his complexion that it was fair in its natural state his features were as delicate as a girl's and set off by two little mouches as we called patches in those days one at the left corner of his mouth the other prolonging as it were the right eye his dress was blue and silver i was so lost in admiration of this beautiful young man that i was as much surprised as if the angel gabriel had spoken to me when the lady of the house brought him forward to present him to me she called him monsieur de la tourelle and he began to speak to me in french but though i understood him perfectly i dared not trust myself to reply to him in that language then he tried german speaking it with a kind of soft lisp that i thought charming but before the end of the evening i became a little tired of the affected softness and effeminacy of his manners and the exaggerated compliments he paid me which had the effect of making all the company turn round and look at me madame ruprecht was however pleased with the precise thing that displeased me she liked either sophie or me to create a sensation of course she would have preferred that it should have been her daughter but her daughter's friend was next best as we went away i heard madame ruprecht and monsieur de la tourelle reciprocating civil speeches with might and main from which i found out that the french gentleman was coming to call on us the next day i do not know whether i was more glad or frightened for i had been kept upon stilts of good manners all the evening but still i was flattered when madame ruprecht spoke as if she had invited him because he had shown pleasure in my society and even more gratified by Sophie's ungrudging delight at the evident interest I had excited in so fine and agreeable a gentleman. Yet, with all this, they had hard work to keep me from running out of the salon the next day, when we heard his voice inquiring at the gate on the stairs for Madame Ruprecht. They had made me put on my Sunday gown, and they themselves were dressed as for a reception. When he was gone away, Madame Ruprecht congratulated me on the conquest I had made, for indeed he had scarcely spoken to any one else beyond what mere civility required, and had almost invited himself to come in the evening to bring some new song, which was all the fashion in Paris, he said. Madame Ruprecht had been out all morning, as she told me, to glean information about Monsieur de la Tourelle. He was a proprietaire, had a small chateau on the Vosges Mountains. He owned land there but had a large income from some sources quite independent of this property. Altogether, he was a good match, as she emphatically observed. She never seemed to think that I could refuse him after this account of his wealth. Nor do I believe she would have allowed Sophie a choice, even had he been as old and ugly as he was young and handsome. I do not quite know. So many events have come to pass since then, and blurred the clearness of my recollections if i loved him or not he was very much devoted to me he almost frightened me by the excess of his demonstrations of love and he was very charming to everybody around me who all spoke of him as the most fascinating of men and of me as the most fortunate of girls and yet i never felt quite at my ease with him i was always relieved when his visits were over although i missed his presence when he did not come he prolonged his visit to the friend with whom he was staying at Karlsruhe on purpose to woo me. He loaded me with presents, which I was unwilling to take, only Madame Ruprecht seemed to consider me an effective prude if I refused them. Many of these presents consisted of articles of valuable old jewellery, evidently belonging to his family. By accepting these I doubled the ties which were formed around me by circumstances even more than by my own consent. In those days, we did not write letters to absent friends as frequently as is done now, and I had been unwilling to name him in the few letters that I wrote home. At length, however, I learned from Madame Ruprecht that she had written to my father to announce the splendid conquest I had made, and to request his presence at my betrothal. I started with astonishment. I had not realized that affairs had gone so far as this. But when she asked me, in a stern, offended manner, what I had meant by my conduct, if I did not intend to marry Monsieur de la Tourelle, I had received his visits, his presents, all his various advances, without showing any unwillingness or repugnance. And it was all true. I had shown no repugnance, though I did not wish to be married to him, at least not so soon. What could I do but hang my head 
and silently consent to the rapid enunciation of the only course which now remained for me if i would not be esteemed a heartless coquette by all the rest of my days there was some difficulty which i afterwards learnt that my sister-in-law had obviated about my betrothal taking place from home my father and fritz especially were for having me return to the mill and there be betrothed and from thence to be married but the Ruprex and Monsieur de la Tourelle were equally urgent on the other side, and Babetta was unwilling to have the trouble of the commotion at the mill, and also, I think, a little disliked the idea of the contrast of my grander marriage with her own. So my father and Fritz came over to the betrothal. They were to stay at an inn in Karlsruhe for a fortnight, at the end of which time the marriage was to take place. Monsieur de la Tourelle told me he had business at home, which would oblige him to be absent during the interval between the two events, and I was very glad of it, for I did not think that he valued my father and my brother, as I could have wished him to do. He was very polite to them, put on all the soft grand manner which he had rather dropped with me, and complimented us all round, beginning with my father and Madame Ruprecht, and ending with little Alvina. But he a little scoffed at the old-fashioned church ceremonies which my father insisted on, and I fancy Fritz must have taken some of his compliments as satire, for I saw certain signs of manner by which I knew that my future husband, for all his civil words, had irritated and annoyed my brother. But all the money arrangements were liberal in the extreme, and more than satisfied, almost surprised, my father. Even Fritz lifted up his eyebrows and whistled. I alone did not care about anything. I was bewitched, in a dream, a kind of despair. I had got into a net through my own timidity and weakness, and I did not see how to get out of it. I clung to my own home people that fortnight, as I had never done before. Their voices, their ways were all so pleasant and familiar to me, after the constraint in which I had been living. I might speak and do as I liked without being corrected by Madame Ruprecht, or reproved in a delicate complimentary way by Monsieur de la Tourelle. One day I said to my father that I did not that I would rather go back to the dear old mill. But he seemed to feel this speech of mine as a dereliction of duty as great as if I had committed perjury, as if, after the ceremony of betrothal, no one had any right over me but my future husband. And yet he asked me some solemn questions, but my answers were not such as to do me any good. Dost thou know any fault or crime in this man that should prevent God's blessing from resting on thy marriage with him? Dost thou feel aversion or repugnance to him in any way? And to all this, what could I say? I could only stammer out that I did not think I loved him enough. And my poor old father saw in this reluctance only the fancy of a silly girl who did not know her own mind, but who had now gone too far to recede. So we were married in the court chapel, a privilege which Madame Ruprecht had used no end of efforts to obtain for us and which she must have thought was to secure us all possible happiness, both at the time and in recollection afterwards. We were married, and after two days spent in festivity at Karlsruhe, among all our new fashionable friends there, I bade good-bye for ever to my dear old father. I had begged my husband to take me by way of Heidelberg to his old castle in the Vosges, but I found an amount of determination under that effeminate appearance and manner for which I was not prepared, and he refused my first request so decidedly that I dared not urge it. Henceforth, Anna, said he, you will move in a different sphere of life, and though it is possible that you may have the power of showing favor to your relations from time to time, yet much or familiar intercourse will be undesirable, and is what I cannot allow." I felt almost afraid, after this formal speech, of asking my father and Fritz to come and see me, but when the agony of bidding them farewell overcame all my prudence, I did beg them to pay me a visit ere long. But they shook their heads, and spoke of business at home, of different kinds of life, of my being a Frenchwoman now. Only my father broke out at last with a blessing, and said, If my child is unhappy, which God forbid, let her remember that her father's house is ever open to her. I was on the point of crying out, Oh, take me back then now, my father, oh, my father, when I felt, rather than saw, my husband present near me. He looked on with a slightly contemptuous air, and taking my hand in his, he led me weeping away, saying that short farewells were always the best when they were inevitable. 
It took us two days to reach a chateau in the Vosges, for the roads were bad and the way difficult to ascertain. Nothing could be more devoted than he was all the time of the journey. It seemed as if he were trying in every way to make up for the separation which every hour made me feel the more complete between my present and my former life. I seemed as if I were only now wakening up to a full sense of what marriage was, and I dare say I was not a cheerful companion on the tedious journey. At length, jealousy of my regret for my father and brother got the better of Monsieur de la Tourelle, and he became so much displeased with me that I thought my heart would break with the sense of desolation. So it was in no cheerful frame of mind that we approached Les Rochers, and I thought that perhaps it was because I was so unhappy that the place looked so dreary. On one side, the chateau looked like a raw, new building, hastily run up for some immediate purpose, without any growth of trees or underwood near it only the remains of the stone used for the building, not yet cleared away from the immediate neighbourhood, although weeds and lichens had been suffered to grow near and over the heaps of rubbish. On the other were the great rocks from which the place took its name, and rising close against them, as if almost a natural formation, was the old castle, whose building dated many centuries back. It was not large nor grand, but it was strong and picturesque, and I used to wish that we had lived in it rather than in the smart, half-furnished apartment in the new edifice, which had been hastily got ready for my reception. Incongruous as the two parts were, they were joined into a whole by means of intricate passages and unexpected doors, the exact positions of which I never fully understood. Monsieur de la Tourelle led me to a suite of rooms set apart for me, and formally installed me in them, as in a domain of which I was sovereign. He apologized for the hasty preparation which was all he had been able to make for me, but promised, before I asked, or even thought of complaining, that they should be made as luxurious as heart could wish before many weeks had elapsed. But when, in the gloom of an autumnal evening, I caught my own face and figure reflected in all the mirrors, which showed only a mysterious background in the dim light of the many candles which failed to illuminate the great proportions of the half-furnished salon. I clung to Monsieur de la Tourelle, and begged to be taken to the rooms he had occupied before his marriage. He seemed angry with me, although he affected to laugh, and so decidedly put aside the notion of my having any other rooms but these, that I trembled in silence at the fantastic figures and shapes which my imagination called up as people in the background of these gloomy mirrors. There was my boudoir, a little less dreary, my bedroom, with its grand and tarnished furniture, which I commonly made into my sitting-room, locking up the various doors which led into the boudoir, the salon, the passages. All but one, through which Monsieur de la Tourelle always entered from his own apartments in the older part of the castle. But this preference of mine for occupying my bedroom annoyed Monsieur de la Tourelle, I am sure, though he did not care to express his displeasure. He would always allure me back into the salon, which I disliked more and more from its complete separation from the rest of the building, by the long passage into which all the doors of my apartment opened. This passage was closed by heavy doors and portiers, through which I could not hear a sound from the other parts of the house, and of course the servants could not hear any movement or cry of mine unless expressly summoned. To a girl brought up as I had been in a household where every individual lived all day in the sight of every other member of the family, never wanted either cheerful words or the sense of silent companionship, this grand isolation of mine was very formidable, and the more so because Monsieur de la Tourelle, as landed proprietor, sportsman, and what not, was generally out of doors the greater part of every day, and sometimes for two or three days at a time. I had no pride to keep me from associating with the domestics. It would have been natural to me in many ways to have sought them out for a word of sympathy in those dreary days when I was left so entirely to myself, had they been like our kindly German servants. But I disliked them, one and all. I could not tell why. Some were civil, but there was a familiarity in their civility which repelled me. Others were rude, and treated me more as if I were an intruder than their master's chosen wife. And yet, of the two sets, I liked these last the best. The principal male servant belonged to this latter class. I was very much afraid of him. He had such an air of suspicious surliness about him in all he did for me. And yet, Monsieur de la Tourelle spoke of him as most valuable and faithful. Indeed, it sometimes struck me that La Ferre ruled his master in some things. 
and this I could not make out. For while M. de la Tourelle behaved towards me as if I were some precious toy or idol, to be cherished and fostered and petted and indulged, I soon found out how little I, or apparently any one else, could bend the terrible will of the man who had on first acquaintance appeared too effeminate and languid to exert his will in the slightest particular. I had learnt to know his face better now, and to see that some vehement depth of feeling, the cause of which I could not fathom, made his grey eye glitter with pale light, and his lips contract, and his delicate cheek whiten on certain occasions. But all had been so open and above board at home, that I had no experience to help me to unravel any mysteries among those who lived under the same roof. I understood that I had made what Madame Ruprecht and her set would have called a great marriage, because I lived in Chateau with many servants, bound ostensibly to obey me as a mistress. I understood that Monsieur de la Tourelle was fond enough of me in his way, proud of my beauty, I dare say, for he often enough spoke about it to me. But he was also jealous and suspicious, and uninfluenced by my wishes, unless they tallied with his own. I felt at this time as if I could have been fond of him too, if he would have let me. But I was timid from my childhood, and before long my dread of his displeasure, coming down like thunder in the midst of his love, for such slight causes as a hesitation in reply, a wrong word, or a sigh for my father, conquered my humorous inclination to love one who was so handsome, so accomplished, so indulgent and devoted. But if I could not please him when indeed I loved him, you may imagine how often I did wrong when I was so much afraid of him as to quietly avoid his company for fear of his outbursts of passion. One thing I remember noticing, that the more Monsieur de la Tourelle was displeased with me, the more Le Fille seemed to chuckle, and when I was restored to favour, sometimes on as sudden an impulse as that which occasioned my disgrace, Le Fille would look askance at me with his cold, malicious eyes and once or twice, at such times, he spoke most disrespectfully to Monsieur de la Tourelle. I have almost forgotten to say that, in the early days of my life at La Roche, Monsieur de la Tourelle, in contemptuous indulgent pity at my weakness in disliking the dreary grandeur of the salon, wrote up to the milliner in Paris from whom my corbeille de mariage had come, to desire her to look out for me a maid of middle age, experienced in the toilette, and with so much refinement that she might, on occasion, serve as companion to me. End of Portion 1 Recording by Jane Greensmith of janegs.com